started. I apologize for being a little late. Um, but welcome everybody to the Asian Carp Advisory Commission meeting. I am Mike Bell, um, I guess, you know, first and foremost an outdoorsman, uh, but also uh, serving the State Senate and uh, at the request of Governor Lee, I'm chair of this advisory commission. Before we get started with the agenda, I know we've got a great group of people here. Hopefully we'll uh, have some information that'll be um, very useful and educational for those of us and in anybody who could be online today. Are there any remarks that any of the commission members would like to make? And I, we don't have to formally call roll. I, I will make the comment that um, Mr. Kurt Holbert is not here. He, he actually sent me a text this morning, had something come up at the last moment uh, where he couldn't be here today and expressed his uh, regrets for not being here. But I do appreciate every, everyone else um, being here. I don't know, maybe we could just go in and call roll. I saw Sammy Arnold, Sammy's here. Oh, yeah, there you are, Sammy. I knew you, I saw you come in. Uh, representing the, um, the Department of Economic and Community Development. And we have uh, Monty Blue, Monty, uh, Wildlife Commissioner, and then Mike Butler with Tennessee Wildlife Federation. Bob Deasy, Bob. Oh, there, Bob. Yeah, there you are, Bob, with um, uh, TBA. Uh, we have Frank Fiss with uh, TWRA. And of course, Kurt said he was uh, uh, called away. Commissioner Salyers. Commissioner Salyers. Well, we have, there you are, Commissioner. Hey, well, welcome, welcome. All right. Uh, and then uh, Dennis Sumlin. Dennis, thank you for being here with us today. And Travis Wiley. Travis, all right, with the core, and then myself. So, again, appreciate everybody, everybody being here today. Are there any remarks any of the commission members would like to make before we get started with the agenda? <clears throat> Seeing none, first on the agenda is a presentation via Zoom by Dr. Teresa Lewis, Director of Midwest U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Fishery Center uh, uh, on the uh, bioacoustical acoustic fish fence, and uh, we've got Dr. Uh, Dr. Lewis. Uh, we also have joining via Zoom Brent Knights with the U.S. Geological Survey, BAFF Research Project Manager, and Neil Jackson, U.S. FWS Ohio River Asian Carp Coordinator. Uh, Chairman Bell. Yes. I, I would like to show a few slides to oh. set up just a few figures to, just to put the, the images in perspective when Dr. Lewis gives her presentation. A, a, absolutely. Let's go to you first for so the let's, slides. Let's do that. Um, so just real brief, car, we're limited in carp control to really barriers and removal, and we've got a couple agenda items today. One matches each of these. Both of these uh, techniques are still in development phases, so uh, all this work is important to learn as we go. It. So the first presentation is going to be on the a bioacoustic fish fence. I just want to show you where it's located. It's at Bark, uh, Bark, Barkley Lock on uh, the Cumberland River, which is the first dam uh, in the river system, and there's a lot of carp below it. That's why it was an ideal place to test a barrier. Uh, bioacoustic fish fence, just some images so you can see what it's like. The, this uh, concrete housing holds all the wires and tubes to deliver the sound lights and bubbles, and that this is submerged in the lock approach at Barkley Lock. When it's in operation, which it is, uh, it, this is all you see is just bubbles coming up. You don't hear anything. You just see these bubbles. This does in no way impede navigation. It just runs, and we hope the fish are, are hearing it, seeing it, and not going through it. And to measure that success, we have uh, fish, hundreds of fish of Many are Asian carp, others are native fish that are tagged with sonic transmitters. And then as these transmitters transmit sound, we have passive receivers located in an array throughout the lock approach so that these, these researchers can watch how fish behave as they approach this lock. So those are just a couple of images so you can kind of get it in your head just what's going on. Uh, and now we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Teresa Lewis, who's the center director at the Fish and Wildlife Service Midwest Fishery Center, and I'll let her take it away from here. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Frank, for that nice introduction and those photos. I, uh, yes, I wasn't able to put together a, a comprehensive set of slides. This is a project we've heard about for a while, but in terms of actual data collection, uh, we 
we don't really have a lot of data slides yet. And so, yes, I'm here to, um, you know, represent our multi-agency science team doing the evaluation of the bioacoustic fish fence or the bath. And it is my expectation that you are at least somewhat familiar with this project. Um, but perhaps there are some people that are less familiar in the virtual audience. I understand that your meetings are taped and posted to YouTube. So um, let me start by identifying our partnership and the scope of this research project. The BATH partnership includes Fish Guidance Systems, our technology partner, and the Corps of Engineers Nashville District, who owns and operates the site at Barclay Lock and Dam in Kentucky, as well as fisheries researchers from the U.S. Geological Survey, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources, and University of Minnesota. And as for the service, uh, you may be familiar, but we have coordination from two different regional offices. Uh, the one where I'm located in the Midwest region, um, now the Great Lakes region, um, that is located in, in Bloomington, Minnesota. And then we also have uh, representation from uh, the regional office there in Atlanta, Georgia. From east to west, our partnership ranges over 4,700 miles. It's the crow, crow flies, and it's a full eight hours in time zone differences. So uh, makes it interesting scheduling research coordination meetings. Uh, anyone in the room who, who uh, coordinates meetings know that even one or two time zones can flip you for a loop. So um, anyway, it's, it's a large partnership and it's been very, very productive to date. And of course, we're expecting that to continue. As a bit of housekeeping, any trade or product or firm names is for descriptive purposes only and does not imply endorsement by the US government. Okay. So keep in mind what we're doing is no small feat, both from an operational viewpoint, as well as from the evaluation of the technology. This is a novel project from both perspectives, and we're learning as much about the engineering and operational requirements to deploy the system in the field as we are about the bath impacts on fish behavior and possible deterrence. There are many commonalities in these proof of concept studies, uh, including the fact that there isn't a one size fits all deterrent. And we certainly haven't gathered enough data at this point for this project to be able to make any final recommendations about any of the deterrents that are in large scale trials at this time. Uh, it is a huge task taking a prefabricated bath or an underwater acoustic deterrent system of any type or carbon dioxide delivery system and fitting it into the unique environment that is a lock and dam with recreational and commercial navigation elements to consider. What is meant by the phrase proof of concept is that we're engaged in a pilot study that has been designed to establish that the deterrent engineering is feasible and can be scaled up from a laboratory or pond study into something that will be effective in larger scale while continuing to show you know, that effective level of deterrence. However, I must tell you, we do not know yet what is effective deterrence with the bath meaning, and we do not expect anything to be 100% effective. However, the individual deterrent, be it the bath or another underwater acoustic deterrent system or something like carbon dioxide, it, those things aren't the end game. We are studying these deterrents to characterize their impacts on fish behavior during various seasonal as well as environmental conditions, the feasibility of their engineering and design and the ability to deploy these new technologies into locations where we may use the deterrent as part of an integrated control system for invasive carp. Like Frank showed you, you know, there are there are multiple, you know, we can remove fish as we encounter them with, you know, commercial fishing, and then we will look at whatever array of deterrent technologies will be appropriate for each system. So research sites are selected with specific criteria in mind, and this includes for, for Barclay, the site at Barclay. Uh, they include locations like lock approaches in pinch point dams where carp are currently present above and below the dam. It's very important that you do have a place that 
has fish, right? We've got to be able to measure whatever level of deterrence will be there. Um, and this project, just to, to be clear, is, um, you know, installed at Lockley, at Barkley Dam and uh, at Lock and Dam 19 on the upper Mississippi River, there is a similar project in terms of it. It's also an acoustic deterrent under study and it's getting underway just now and will be running in parallel with the rest of BAF study. And these are sites where we can learn what, if any, impacts there on com are on commercial or recreational navigation, as well as those potential impacts on native fishes. We are very mindful of that, although we are focusing much of our effort in terms of studying uh, fish behavior on the silver carp as the fish that we can get the most tags into and look at deterrence. But we are very mindful that we want to study potential impacts on native fishes as well. I feel that people are always, you know, thinking about the objective focused on deterrence of, of the invasive carp. But as I mentioned, it is not trivial taking a prefabricated system and fitting it into the unique environment that is a lock and dam. So uh, there are things that we've learned to date from the engineering deployment and operational aspects. Um, and I, I'm, I hope I'm not assuming anything I believe that this group is familiar with many of the elements of the project based on what Frank told me when he asked me for, for this update on the project, um, you know, from the ongoing proof of concept study. But just to restate probably what is obvious, we've learned it isn't easy to put in any of these deterrents in the water, but we're doing it and we are learning a lot. So um, early on, even before installation there at the site at Barkley, we had to meet all environmental and permitting requirements. And I was involved with the Section 7 consultation for native mussels. And I wish to gratefully acknowledge in this room uh, TWRA's assistance with the mussel surveys and the relocation prior to the, the dredging at Barkley uh, was greatly appreciated. Uh, we've also learned about some of the impacts of high water on site, as well as the time to get bath maintenance teams to the site, uh, especially during this pandemic. There have been a lot of things learned with this project related to the pandemic. Uh, those were not in any study design or work plan. There are site specific influences that contribute to the varying installation and maintenance costs. And I cannot overstate that deterrents are not a one size fits all. Um, however, like any other mechanical device or barrier, the bath can be da damaged or potentially fail. Um, and we know this even you know, with the electric barrier, um, they, they are mechanical bits of equipment. So uh, in fact, the bath was struck by lightning last year. And since then there has been some damage to some of the sound projection units and remote monitoring capabilities. Um, but, you know, fish guidance systems and partners, we've been able to work through these things. And just this week, fish guidance systems completed some maintenance and repairs to the bath. And while I will speak more about telemetry as the analytical method um, in which we're looking at how these fish are moving in the water, uh, they are also parts of a mechanical system, the telemetry equipment. And um, yeah, they too can uh, be damaged and require repair. And so we have also learned that, you know, the telemetry element as well as as uh, the bath, the bioacoustic fish fence itself has um, had some, you know, scale up issues. I, I think that the two arrays we have in place uh, are really comprehensive to be able to measure fish movement in that area. But there are a lot of caveats that we're learning. Given the unpredictability of water levels, silt buildup, and other events that have occurred during the study to date, budgeting and contracting for the bath was challenging, and that would be true for any deterrent system. Uh, this is a natural part of the proof of concept approach, and as issues arise and particulars of the site are better 
understood this unpredictability is resolving. And so that's also a great outcome of, of what we're learning to date. Along with the BAF operation and engineering study, we have the research work plan for the three-year duration of the project to study fish behavior in the presence of the BAF. And the BAF is turned on and off on a weekly basis. Um, yes, weekly. And uh, I definitely want to thank Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources staff for being such a great partner in the study in terms of boots on the ground, as well as their many other contributions. Uh, we have also defined during the time we've spent already on this system um, what the bath buffer zone is. If you remember the photo that, that Frank showed you that had the bubbles kind of lined out, that wasn't straight. And of course, that's not necessarily directly over the mechanical structure that is the bath underwater, okay? Um, this bath buffer zone is an important definition to make since it fixes in place what we consider the bath location for our telemetry analyses, okay? Um, much, if you remember that picture, he had a couple of red lines that kind of identified some, you know, just to draw your attention to where that bubble uh, line is in the water. But we are actually looking at something that is a 30 meter wide zone for our telemetry analyses. And it needs to be fixed in place because the bubble curtain itself is not static, but moves in response to the natural current and water flow, as well as other factors that influence the location of the bubble curtain. Okay, so it's 15 meters upriver and 15 meters downriver. But we look at it as a full 30 meters because things can shift. And so the center, you know, basically where we would expect the hardware of the bath to be located, it, it isn't always that clear cut. And so we want to um, use what we can consider a fixed yard stick, or in this case, a meter stick, indicating the location that allows us to define behaviors like the bath, uh, fish encountering the bath or crossing the bath with an objective scientific measurement, not a, oh, well, the water's moving this way today, so let's take the measurement here to say, well, they're coming up, they're swimming up to it, they're getting into that zone, but they're not crossing, or they're getting into that zone, and potentially they're just hanging out, or they are being deterred or trying to avoid the uh, bath and moving back out of that buffer zone. And so, um, yes, we are, uh, it's important that we have these definitions for the, the sake of the the research, okay? Um, and we have, have with the telemetry taking positional locations of the fish. You know, a lot of times you hear people talk about pinging locations, nothing you can hear, but those radio transmitters do send out a signal and we can then identify that a bath encounter is when we have been able to collect with telemetry at least three consecutive positional locations downstream of the bath followed by at least three consecutive positions in the buffer zone without actually crossing over. And then, you know, in terms of, well, what does crossing over mean if you have 30 meters? That crossing is defined as at least the three consecutive positions downstream of the buffer zone, followed by at least three consecutive positions upstream of the buffer zone, okay? And we are, for the intent of our study, looking at movement towards and into the lock chamber. We're not looking at, at fish currently. We're not studying uh, the movements of fish that are moving through the gates and then over the bath and then out uh, into the um, uh, water surrounding there. So uh, tracking the fish to understand their behavior is potentially uh, you know, influenced by the bath is accomplished by using these telemetry tagged fish and we have two different types of tags. There are Vimco tags that collect one dimensional movement up and down the river, okay? Uh, kind of that simple orientation. And we plan to tag 75 silver carp each spring in the and in spring and fall of the study, plus 60 native fishes. And these are 20 each in terms of target numbers 
for paddlefish, smallmouth buffalo, and freshwater drum each spring and fall. Okay. Vimco tagged fish are returned to the area where they are caught, and then the other type of tag we're using, the HTI tag, are collected from upstream of the bath and they are translocated to the downstream approach. And this is done because prior research has shown that translocation provides a motivation for the fish to move back upstream. And we wanted to ensure there was a motivation outside of seasonal cues or natural swimming behaviors to drive the fish to cross the bath if, if they're going to. The HTI tags collect data in two dimensions, at least, which allows us to collect more locational detail about where the fish are moving in the water as they approach the bioacoustic fish fins and possibly cross it. The, the HTI tags collect presence and absence data for fish in the tailwaters near the lock discharge systems, in the lock and above the lock. So HTI tags yield more precise locational data for the tagged silver carp, um, albeit at a higher cost, okay? And we haven't always hit our target numbers for native species, but we've been successful in capturing and tagging the number of silver carp uh, targeted for both the VIMCO and HTI tag efforts. Uh, we plan to tag 300 fish silver carp in the fall and spring of each year through the fall of 2022, with that effort starting last fall in uh, 2020. And uh, the HTI tags are the tag type for any of the data that I am mentioning from here until the end of my presentation. Okay, so to date, we have very raw data for 254 silver carp from the one season uh, starting early November 2020 to mid-February 2021. And that's, you know, not very many fish in terms of the large scale of our experiment, which is why we're not prepared to share any percentages of deterrence or anything about any environmental or seasonal impacts on fish behavior, because we just don't have that type of information yet. We are seeing, seeing fish move to encounter as well as cross the bath when it is off and when it is on, we are seeing fish encounter the bath and less often crossing the bath. So to illustrate where we're at then with our HTI tagging, our project targets for HTI tag silver carp totals are basically 1800 fish, at least 1800 silver carp. Okay, and that's with the HTI. We're also, just to remind you, doing the VIMCO tagging with silver carp as well as the natives. The 254 fish tag represents 14% of our overall HTI tagging goal. And this is required, this number is required to produce a statistically significant data set. And you should be aware that not all the fish that are tagged stay at the location post tagging or even return seasonally okay after they've been tagged and released um, and then as i mentioned before we uh, have have a smaller target for our native fish totals and and we have not even gotten 14 percent of those fish tagged they're uh, a lot more difficult to catch uh, than the uh, silver fit the silver carp and we are very encouraged by the results to date and we're moving forward now with spring 2021 tagging and that is going to start that effort it's going to start the week of april 12th we have uh folks uh, from kentucky as well as from usgs and the fish and wildlife service who will be uh, there on site of course we've had to uh, devise safe practices in light of the pandemic in terms of getting people uh, both to locations um you know through travel we can't just fill a truck with people and equipment and move it out from, you know, the distant locations, USGS and Fish and Wildlife Service. And it's been difficult to have uh, risk assessments approved where we can have a boat that has mixed staff, although um, we are very mindful of those risk assessments. And we're very happy that we've been able to successfully deploy the crews that we needed both last fall and this year, the plan is that there will be no impacts 
um, that haven't been addressed at least previously in terms of sending our staff to the site to work. Okay. And um, previous year monitoring results at Barclay and other locations uh, have indicated that silver tarp, carp, indeed many fish, are more motivated to be on the move in the spring. And so we're planning to ramp up our HTI tagging numbers this particular season and uh, tag 400 silver carp for spring 2021. And uh, we were just fortunate enough to find some extra tagging and we are just investing back into the project wherever we can. So by the middle of April, we'll also have some new telemetry equipment installed, which will allow for um, one for some repairs that have needed to be done, but also to better um, establish the triangulation capabilities of the array. Okay, and this will also allow us to continue to ramp up the study in terms of the statistical strength of our fish tracking data and results uh, to conduct the multiple analyses planned by the team that will also take into account environmental impacts and seasonality on fish behaviors. And then, yes, we're continuing the engineering and deployment feasibility component of the BAF study. So the next steps for the project include the expanded telemetry system, being able to provide us with even more data about fine scale fish behavior, which actually may help us be able to inform fish guidance systems if we notice there are any specific bass, bath of vulnerabilities in terms of uh, where fish may be crossing. Uh, we will use that information that we're getting from the telemetered fish to uh, let fish guidance systems know that. And that way they may be able to actually tweak the system while they're in the field, while it is installed, but also to take that information, you know, there will always be another design study, right? They'll be able to make refinements before the next bath is uh, put together and potentially deployed at another location after we've gathered our results and provided them to the group. Um, we will continue to study the bath effectiveness and a wider range of environmental conditions that we expect to occur in this very dynamic river system. Uh, we'll continue to tag fish, of course, as I said, in the fall and spring seasons. And we also plan to complete some analyses that will incorporate a time to event model to statistically compare crossings with the bath on versus crossings with the bath off under the different range of environmental conditions and factors that we're encountering and are planned to encounter in the next two years. And this will be done, the analyses will be done for both VIMCO as well as the HTI tagged fish, which will allow us to analyze behavior for fish naturally occurring in the tailwater rather than those translocated, which is an assessment of the native species and, nat and silver carp natural behavior in the system. Uh, that we'll also be able to compare with the translocated silver carp that we believe are more mo motivated to cross the bath and return to their capture location. Okay, so uh, in conclusion, you know, the bath project is, is just now really entering a very exciting phase. And um, I'm certain I'm not just speaking for myself, but for the research team and all the partners in saying that we look forward to sharing more research results with you in the future. And uh, just in conclusion, if you have any additional questions that you would like to pose to our external affairs uh, points of contact, we have Tim Petronsky from the Bloomington, Minnesota Regional Office and Daphne Pitchford, who's located in Atlanta, and uh, they will be able to help answer any additional questions, plus the fact that we have uh, Brent Knights with us today for uh, USGS and some of the more detailed telemetry questions you may have, as well as Neil Jackson, who is the um, sub-basin coordinator for this system. So thank you very much for your attention. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. Dr. Lewis, uh, could I ask any of the members of the commissions, they have any questions directly to you? Could sure. you take, okay. Anybody have any questions for Dr. Lewis? Uh, Dennis, uh, Mr. Tumlin, you're recognized. 
Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you for that great presentation. Very thorough, Dr. Lewis, and, and I appreciate the information. Had a couple of questions. Have y'all set internal timelines of when you think that these tests, um, you hope to have uh, this test runs through this date and we're gonna be finished with the test? Have you established those timelines yet? Um, we have established some timelines that are not so tightly <laughs> described as that like i said we've had some issues with the telemetry array itself and you know with the bath itself getting hit by lightning that has uh we've had to shift some things okay uh brent correct me if i'm wrong but we're hopeful that by the end of this year we would have you know three field seasons worth of data um that we will at least partially have analyzed uh, we're just now even, I mean, we haven't even started any of the time to event analyses because the environmental conditions have pretty much stayed, uh, you know, similar. Uh, we haven't haven't gone through multiple seasons. And so, uh, like I say, Brent, feel free to jump in, but I'm thinking that we would have probably something uh, that is much more uh, statistically sound and have those numbers uh, by the end of this year. Uh, at least for the first, uh, say, uh, year phase of the project. Yeah, I would agree with that. We'll have three seasons under our belt and mm -hmm. some type of analysis uh, done by this time next year, I would assume. Great, as long thank as you the for fish, that. Fish in the system cooperate. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, last question. Uh, I think you mentioned that um, you're at about 14% of your goal for your sample size, your tagging. Is it about 14%? Um, and you st there's a couple of seasons that you're going to continue tagging. What's your biggest, bottle biggest bottleneck to getting to 100% of your sample size? Uh, what, what's, um, the, what's holding you back the greatest from getting to 100% of your sample to expedite your results? Well, we've got the logistics of getting people into the field to tag fish. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that people might think that that um, 1800 silver carp may not be so much to contact in that area or certainly easily uh, able to be accomplished within three years time or potentially two or even one year's time. But uh, there are a number of things. We've got to get people there and the pandemic has done some small amount, but really hasn't um, uh, kept us from tagging the numbers that we uh, plan to do. Uh, because of water levels and, and other things, there are just certain times of the year, about the time that the fish start moving and are more easy to contact. Uh, we have a short, a relatively short window time, usually a month. Uh, where we can get all of these factors together, the staff, the numbers of fish, you know, we're proposing 300 to 400 because those tags are not inexpensive. And so we've had to take the phased approach for that. And so I would say, you know, there is an economic element, there's a personnel element, there's a bit of a weather, you know, factor in terms of getting people uh, out and um, catching fish without, you know, tagging a fish can be very stressful. So if you put them back into water that is too warm as as actually starts to occur in this location kind of in May or so, um, those are all limiting factors. Thank and you I so would much. just add too that there's a design element to that as well. We're, mm -hmm. We wouldn't want to go out there and tag all our fish at one time. Um, for one thing, the, the batteries don't last long in the, in the splintered fish. Yeah. We're also trying to Again, we're working in a very, you know, temporally and spatially dynamic system, and we want to capture that dynamics. And to do that, it, it takes, you know, a couple of years of time at a minimum. We want, uh, you know, variable uh, water levels, variable barge traffic, variable uh, um, motivation by the fish. All mm -hmm. those kind of things are part of the study design, which, again, it's not about just going out and tagging 800, 1,800 fish. So. Any further questions? Chairman. You're, rec you're recognized. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Lewis, for the presentation. When, when, and I, I think you've said this, but when did this project actually start at Barclay? So the bath was actually installed. There was a delay in installation. It was installed in the fall of 2019. Okay. 
And what, what if you can say, what, what are the costs of the acoustic barrier? I mean, what, what's the total project number on that? I mean, to, to, to implement that program at Barclay. Uh, is there someone from the regional office that would like to field that question? I, I, you know, could say some very general numbers, but I, I can't speak to the specific price. Yeah, tag. just a general number. I'm just wondering. Well, um, Teresa, hey, Teresa, this is Aaron from the regional office. I was trying to unmute my line, so I apologize while I was trying, stumbling, trying to get that. It's a, that's a, a great, a great question. And I could, uh, very, in very short order, I do not have it at my fingertips, but I could give you an idea of what we, what we spent so far, but I, I will say that, you know, it's, a it, it's going to be variable. Um, and it, it's, it, it's, this is, this is very much an experiment and very much a, you know, as Teresa had said, you know, a, an evaluation of something that's worked well in the lab, but we're trying to see if it, if it translates well into working into a large field system. And, with that, you know, of course, we're, we're learning a lot and have learned a lot and there's been and, and there were some things that have to be done at each site to make it a little bit site specific. But uh, it's uh, so that number is going to change based on those factors. So I I, I, I mean, I, I, I could I could tell you what we've spent on this project so far, but I don't think it's going to be instructive moving moving forward. I think we'll have a better answer for that question once we've uh, we've evaluated, you know, the, completed the study and evaluated and, and, and have, have a little bit more information. Okay. Can, can you say how much you spent there at that location? Uh, like I said, it's been a multi-year study, and we've had we've had some we've had some damage. I mean, I can give you that number. My my concern is that if I give you a number, that, that I don't want you to leave thinking that that's that's what it's going to cost for every one of these in the future. Right. Right. Sure. Yeah. I'm, obviously, I know it would have variables, and each location would have variables. But you know, I was just wondering. I mean, the, I, I can tell you. I mean, the, pro, the project cost so far is, is roughly this. This is this is a a, a rough number um, for everything we've done so far. But it also includes tagging and, and staffing. It's about a ten million dollar investment in this evaluation so far. But it, that is not what we believe it would cost to install mm -hmm. one of these things and operate one of these things in the future. Should 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 this should this test you know be be positive and, and be something that you know the agencies want to move forward with? Right. Okay. Okay. Any further questions? For me and the members? Oh, yeah, you're, yeah, you're recognized. Uh, Bob D.C. with the Tennessee Valley Authority. Uh, Dr. Lewis, uh, thank you for your presentation, first of all. Um, it, it sounds like that um, your agency has been doing a lot of study and research on the different systems that are out there. And with the systems... I'm sorry. Um, Bob D.C. with the Tennessee Valley Authority. Um, thank you, Dr. Lewis. Um, with the systems that you have out there, there's been a lot of research and study done on them, whether it's carbon dioxide, electric, and the, and the bath. Which one is the most furthest along or the most promising? You know, I can't say promising in terms of anything because uh, they are all showing promise and they're, they're all being used in different locations and to deal with, you know, different different elements of what we need to learn and want to learn about deterrence and you know are able to to get into the field into different locations um <clears throat> so in terms of which one is best that is the question uh, the answer that i can provide but if you would repeat the other part i know you asked uh, a two-part question sorry no it's it uh it's a one-part question looking for the one oh. that's the most promising that's out there okay okay um, we're excited by the promise that all these projects are showing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any any further questions? Well, Dr. Lewis, I've got one one question, and it's like these other ones. It may be kind of tough to answer, but if um, if today, if we decided to propose to put one of these at Nickajack or at Chickamauga, what agencies, how much coordination would we have to have to get approval to put one of those in. Who all is involved in the approval process to put a barrier uh, at, at one of the dams or one of the locks? Well, um, I may not be able to comprehensively answer that. I will start out and then if there's others that want to say something, but you know, those environmental permits and approvals, and so you'll have to have core 
of engineers, uh, you know, the approval, if you're putting it into uh, anything that involves any kind of a core structure, um, Section 7, you know, Section 10, uh, Endangered Species Act coordination, anything um, other than that in terms of state concerns, you know, state listed species and things that if there's potential impacts in that. And, and um, yeah, so I think a combination of, of your state, uh, the Corps of Engineers and Fish and Wildlife Service would get you likely most of the approvals, if not all of the approvals that you would need. Uh, other human health, you know, uh, thing, certifications and things like that. I think we've, we're learning that we don't have to uh, worry over much about that. CO2, there may be some other uh, environmental permitting in terms of water quality, okay? And so I can, can suggest that that is another thing that you would need to do is talk to your state water quality folks. Thank you. Hey, Ter Teresa, this is Alan Brown. I'm the Assistant Regional Director for Fishing and Aquatic Conservation at the Atlanta office. Um, certainly, you know, Teresa was, was giving uh, quite a comprehensive list of, of agencies that, that uh, we would need to coordinate with, and it certainly is, it can be long. Um, CORE, TVA, uh, whoever happens to own the dam, and, and mm -hmm. uh, state agencies, and, and uh, it runs the gamut from, from you know, construction permits and, and archaeological surveys in some points and, and things. So it is, it is definitely a coordinated effort. I think the, the experience that we've had with the BAF system gives us, a, gives us an edge on the kinds of things that we need to do, and, and maybe there are some things in that that we didn't think about that uh, we know now that we need to do. But it is certainly a, a, a well-coordinated effort um, for it to, to install any of the kinds of deterrents in, in any of the locks and dams that we may, you know, think appropriate. Okay. All right. Thank you. Really one follow-up yeah, question, yeah, Mr. Absolutely, Chairman. Absolutely, Dennis. Just follow up to his question. In your experience, how long does it take to permit all those agencies that you just talked about? Um, in your experience, if we started today, in, how long does that typically take for someone to say this site is ready um, and coordinating all those agencies? Just, just ballpark. I know every site's variable, but um, based on your experience. Last question. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm trying to think. I've been involved with the Section 7 uh, permitting process for both the projects at Lock and Dam 19 and at Barkley, as well as the uh, carbon dioxide project. I'm, I'm pretty involved in the uh, regulatory element of that and registration for carbon dioxide. Um, I, yeah, I think that Ultimately, even using Lock and Dam 19 and Bath is the more the more recent projects. Uh, probably a year if everything goes great. Maybe, maybe you could shave it off to 10 months, and maybe it would take much longer, a year and a half or more. It kind of depends on what impediments you hit. Um, you know, of course, to to uh, determine. You know, if for example, as I mentioned, you know. TWRA did a muscle relocation for us. If we had encountered something that we would not have been able to move, uh, or if it had somehow been proposed, you know, without any pre-awareness in terms of archaeological concerns or critical habitat, right? You may actually hit a wall, but I would say a year is is a good average for the experience that we've we've had thus far. Thank you. Any further? That's it. Well, Dr. Lewis, thank you for being with us today. And, and uh, Frank, are we going to just go straight to the, the next guest? Is that what you? OK. Thank you for being with us, Dr. Lewis. Thank you for pre your presentation. And then thank next we much. have, and I think we've been hearing from him a little bit on and off the last few minutes, uh, Brent Knights with the U.S. Geological Survey, BAF Research Project Manager, and Neil Jackson with the uh, United States Fish and Wildlife Service, Ohio, Ohio River Asian Carp Coordinator. Those yeah, guys, Frank. Were, those guys are on the on were on the Zoom for questions, and I think they've satisfied their responsibility there. Okay. So if if you if you're ready, we could move on to the uh, Asian Carp well, Harvest let's, Incentive. Let's move program. on to the Asian okay. Carp Harvest Incentive Program. Alrighty. Let's see here. Okay, we're well, just shifting gears. Well, before we shift gears, I mean, I, th I think we saw that 
like I said but with my first slide, that both of the tools that we have are in developmental phases. And there's a lot, a lot of lessons are being learned at the BAF. You know, imagine the cost of building the first car, not the millionth car. So that's kind of what we're into here. And, you know, our agency is ready to step in and help out where we can, but there's a lot of expertise that we don't have. And we're, we're going to rely on all these partners to get this done if, if it lands in, in Tennessee that we're working. And we've been really, really blessed to have uh, TVA kind of leading on the uh, environmental assessment work. So I just wanted to say that, and you know, not much different in, in some ways. Maybe a little simpler, but not not for us biologists. You know, we're working on economics here with uh, with carp removal and in our incentive program. So we're we're learning as we go on this as well, and we hope that we can improve this process as as we learn. So just to quickly go over, I'm going to go over the, our eight, what we've done with our harvest incentive program, and we also have some guests here that represent people that are within that HIP program to talk about their experience. So remove, we, our, our, our uh, HIP program, our Asian Har Har Harvest Incentive Program, focuses fishing effort on the lakes where, on the lower ends of the river where we have abundant carp populations and it makes the most strategic sense to remove fish from there before those fish create uh, propagule pressure to push fish upstream. And the, like the, the simple goal was to just get people that are already commercial, commercially fishing to start fishing for carp. And I think we've done that, but we definitely can improve on our, on our process. We started out in around 2018 with this program. One of the things that we did early on was we used our purchasing power to buy a lot of netting materials and, and we made bulk orders and we were able to give away netting materials so fishermen didn't have as, as large of an investment to shift over into this new industry. Uh, we, we quickly learned about things like inventory and having the right stock for the right people and we've gotten out of that. We would rather that the, uh, the fishermen buy their own nets because we weren't able to keep up with, in some cases, what mesh size they wanted and us storing the nets and we had problems getting them. But anyway, we, we could revisit that. We know the fishermen enjoyed that, but it wasn't, we don't know that we were doing it as well as it could be done. Uh, so we dropped that. We felt that there was definitely a need to have more money available for our per pound incentive program. But another thing that we did before I jump to that is we did uh, issue a grant to the Paris Henry County Industrial Committee for $75,000 in 2017. The, the businesses needed funds to get bigger so they could be able to buy more fish, even if there were fishermen there that they don't have anywhere to sell it, there's, they're not going to fish. So that was the that was, that was why we uh, issued those that grant uh, in 2020. We revisited that process because because the businesses that we were working with in HIP expressed a need for even more capacity so they could be more competitive to to attract big, in, and play in bigger markets. So that, this process is ongoing. We haven't paid out all of these funds yet. Uh, we, we issued funds to uh, Paris Henry County Industrial Committee and to Benton County. So the, the, most of the funds that we have dedicated to the incentive program are in our, our per pound incentive process. If you, if the, we, we pay the, the wholesale fish dealer 13 cents a pound for every pound of fish that they buy from commercial fishermen at higher rates than they would normally want to pay. So that's how the money, this 13 cents does get to the fishermen. It also gets to the buyer. And it allow, we hope that this model is allowing this to grow. And, and hopefully someday maybe be self-sufficient where it doesn't need as much incentive. I'll just, uh, here, here's our track record on that since September of 2018. We've had some ups and downs that there's been, uh, there, there are some seasonal reasons for these ups and downs, but I think the most important thing is that we have removed over 7 million pounds. Uh, this, these data on the far right side from March of 21 are based on not records, but phone calls of what we think is coming in. It's a pretty uh, safe bet that about 700,000 pounds are coming in this month. That was our best month on record by far. And I think we'll hear that you know, the potential for this is there going forward. So we are, we have geared up. We, as an agency, we've shifted from 
putting uh, state dollars into this at 250,000 one year, 400,000 the next year, and then TVA helped out in that same year. And then this year we're up to, where are we at? We're at $794,000 available for CARP contracts. That'll take us through the end of August, and then in September we'll have new contracts. Fortunately, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is funding our contract fishery for the, in this current cycle. So that $794,000 is coming through the, uh, the Ohio River Asian Carp uh, Fund, if you will. And then next, for the next set of contracts that we write, we will have $842,000 available, we, we believe. Uh, and that'll cover about six and a half million pounds of fish. So we hope that, you know, having this, this uh, capacity uh, publicly announced will, will give the commercial industry, uh, you know, the green light to go at least this far in selling carp with the incentive program. Frank, that, could I ask sure. a quick question? Yeah. Um, you know, if we had a magic wand and could put 10 or 2, 5, 10 million in that, is, are there people out there to fulfill that contract? I mean, what, what would, um, and I know this is kind of a more general question we could yeah. get into, but again, if we had that magic wand and had as much money as we wanted to, uh, outside the barriers, which we know are going to be expensive and we know we're still in the test phase, what could we put money to into what we're currently doing that would offer the most help? Well, I, you know, mentioning the deterrence is good because the deterrence and the removal are, are part of a package of, of a complete plan to get rid of, to, to reduce and hopefully stop the fish from moving all the way upstream. But the, you know, I guess you're asking how much money, would, would I rather see that number at 10 million pounds? I, I think I would if, if we could do it. Um, it. Don't forget that the state of Kentucky has similar programs and have, have had good years and bad as well. They're, they're, I was on the phone with Kentucky today. They apparently are not buying as much as they were. But, you know, they, in the past, they, they had actually harvested more fish from the Kentucky side than we had on the Tennessee side. So it's not just this number. I don't, I wish I knew how many millions of pounds are in Kentucky and Barclay Lakes. Ideally, we want to remove way more than the rate that they are moving into the system to start having a negative, uh, you know, negatively impact that population. Uh, I think that you know, we, we haven't, I not, didn't get into the distribution of carp here, but you know, we have not seen significant movement of abundant populations in the system in a few years now. And I'm not going to say it's because of this happened. I can't prove that by cause, but I'm right. glad this is here. I wouldn't mind seeing if it, what would happen if we put a little more in, into it. And the problem is you, you know, you could put another million into this and have an impact if the businesses are able to get and that's what I was asking. Market, that's what you know, I was the asking. The fishermen can't, they can't sell it. There's right. no, we can't get the fish out. So okay. it's a little bit of chicken and the egg thing. And maybe these guys can speak to some of that. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. So. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And uh, with that, I, I would introduce uh, Rob Goad and Clay Young, who are, are here as car, uh, the AHIP participants. Uh, I'll, I guess we'll start with Rob Goad. He's a, uh, He's the director of the Paris Henry County Industrial Committee, and he's prepared to give some remarks. We'll have him. He'll come up here. Is, should he come to the mic here in front? I think he should come here. Or come up here. Get a better oh, camera yeah. angle on him. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Sure. Absolutely. Well, we, we are also, we have a whole research team out there looking at best ways to count carp, so to speak, so that you know, this isn't, we're not going to be, we're going to be doing this for a few years. I, ideally, I, I will have the ability to have reliable estimates of are there more carp here this year than last year. That, those kinds of questions are eluding us right now because we, we've had a few years of just learning how to repeatably, you know, scientifically repeatably capture these fish. They, they do things a lot differently than our bass and crappie do. So that, that, that's the kind of thing that we want to iron out so we can answer that question better uh, over time. But we are, we are working on that too. Yeah, well, there's other things too that we can, if, 
if we start hearing that the, the, the that they're having a harder time catching fish, that would indicate that. If we if we had a deter if we knew they weren't coming, it's hard because they're coming in at a, at a rate that's unknown too. And we're we're measuring that rate on another study using movement stuff, but we we want to know that we are taking them out faster than they're going in and. In a t typical fish population, you'd be able to look at growth overfishing and recruitment overfishing to see that you're taking all the adults out. If it gets harder to find big fish, that like we've had with some other exploited fisheries, then we know that overfishing, we want overfishing to happen in this case. So we, we, there are some other cues aside from total number of carp that we can monitor, I guess is what I'm trying to get to. And we'll get there. Yeah. It's going to be a good day when that happens. <laughs> That's right. All right. Thank you all. All right. Good afternoon. Uh, as Frank mentioned, I'm Rob Goad, Executive Director of Paris Henry County Industrial Committee. I uh, was asked to come here and kind of discuss what we've seen at the county level from the uh, and from the industrial committee side and how we've handled the HIP program. Um, so as he had mentioned, the first 75,000 went, went very quickly as an incentive to our commercial fishermen and our fisheries. Um, I wasn't there at the time. I came in right when we had just implemented a pilot program using a revolving loan fund to help acquire commercial boats for our commercial, commercial fishermen. Um, that's when I knew my leadership was serious. I did a deep dive found the metrics, what it was actually costing us directly in terms of lost tourism dollars and sport fishing on Kentucky Lake. It became very clear to me that we needed to incentivize this ourselves. And fortunately enough, Frank and TWRA actually provided that additional funds in 2020. So what we were able to do is try to streamline the process. We received the money act as, as again, as it states here, the grantee. We acted as a pass-through. We provided accountability on the program. Um, just like I do in economic development, when I abate taxes or I provide uh, free land, there is always accountability attached to it. Um, I believe that should be. That's just uh, good use of taxpayer funds. Um, there's a certain amount of poundage that has to be required to be caught. They have to increase production. Um, and also, we obviously need to ensure that what we're purchasing is, is improving their ability to go out and catch these fish and market these fish. Um, so I approached this very much so in my past life, I did a lot of grant writing and project administration for a development district. So I applied local procurement guidelines in this particular case. Anything below $5,000 we took three quotes on from local vendors, uh, and we use that to acquire those, those low cost items. Anything above $5,000, open it up to a public bid process. That included a bid specification for our, you know, in, in a lot of these cases, we needed capacity, as Frank also mentioned, large freezer space, coolers, um, down to new electrical work to handle the additional, the, uh, the refrigeration units, asphalt to handle the trucks. Because again, these, these uh, fisheries are creating markets that didn't exist prior to this. So it has grown, and I'll let Clay talk more to that. He knows those numbers, but they have done a phenomenal job. Um, uh, Sammy, as you're aware, I mean, you know, we've, I have experience working with state and, and federal grants. And so we approached it very much with the understanding that as a grantee or the pass through, uh, we were accountable as well. We want the program to work. We want it to hold up under scrutiny. So the invoicing came through us. We verified acquisition, verified the capital improvement was made, took photographs, uh, and then paid the invoice, cut a check to either the vendor or to the fishery. Um, it's absolutely critical. This is an emerging market, just like if I had a manufacturer come and want to locate in Henry County. They expect incentives. They use that to reduce their risk. Uh, they also use that to cash flow their operation the first couple of years. Um, I believe in the program. I've seen it work. Uh, Clay and, and Dennis 
of Hart's Fish Market have done, have been uh, extremely above board, done everything above and beyond what they said they were going to do. Um, and again, the proof are in the numbers in his, in his uh, production and increases since then. Um, you know, I, we have to do something. I think that this is a great way to incentivize the continued fishing of this. The uh, idea that uh, we want to bring more commercial fishermen in. I would love to use our utilities revolving loan fund again to assist commercial fishermen in acquiring new boats. But if a chip can continue, maybe we could look at something like that. But again, even under our program, they have to catch a, a certain amount of poundage that is obviously followed by uh, through the incentive program at TWRA. We, what we have agreed to do is basically extend a 0% loan. The industrial committee covers the interest on this revolving loan fund program. Um, so there's still risk uh, at the end of this, but at the same time, we do lessen the uh, financial hardship on them. Um, but uh, I think that moving forward, if the HIP program continues, um, you know, we always run into this and even in the grant side, even on economic development projects, you know, private side moves at its own rate. They move very quickly. And it's not something that you can assign to a certain date on the calendar. Uh, we have to be prepared to be fluid. And that's why I think that as an industrial committee or an industrial board, if, you know, in other parts of the state, you know, number one, there's no cost to the program. We run it through, it's, it's just something we do to assist our local economy. And we'll continue to do that. Uh, we have the ability to, uh, we'll, for one, we have the institutional knowledge on staff, but we also have ability to be flexible on our own right. Um, we'd like to see that the funds as they come, what we did, we submitted a proposal. We assisted our fisheries with submitting a proposal and, and budgets. Those were approved by TWRA, reviewed and approved. And then we drew down those funds. What we'd like to see, and perhaps in the future, again, moving forward, is that instead of drawing down those funds, looking at an invoice, submitting a T TWRA, and, wait, and allow it, and waiting for their review to come back, um, that perhaps those funds would be direct deposited into our account upon approval. We can demonstrate, obviously, we'll continue to do so, uh, that things are being bought, that they're, so they're being bought, that obviously it's absolutely related to uh, you know, mitigating or eradicating Asian carp in our, in our lake. Um, but otherwise, everything's been great. They're, Clay has created markets that didn't exist, and so we don't know. We're moving forward. We're learning as we go. There are certain times that those markets open, and they have to have the capacity to meet demand. And by turning them away, they might lose, vent they lose you know, potential customers. Uh, but I'm, I'd answer any questions if you... Welcome, any questions? Thank you for the presentation. Any questions? Commissioner? Frank, if you want to address that. I want to make sure I'm mic for the audience. The, uh, the, the funds for the, for the grants to, uh, say, Paris Henry County, are state dollars. They, they're ex, at least in the current uh, rules of the game, if you will, we cannot use Fish and Wildlife Service for these kinds of grants. So we're, we're happy to use their, those funds for the contract fishing, but we can't do it for this. So we were the, our, our commission approved $400,000 for this in 2020. Is there? Well, there's recently authorized uh, uh, funding for for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to do uh, Asian carp eradication. We don't know how those rules will be drafted, and it's kind of a moot point until those funds are also appropriated, and they've not been appropriated. So we're eager. And that's one of the things that we're we are when asked we are we are asking that that be a possibility. Thank you. Yeah. And and Frank, let me ask you one more question. When when you say state dollars, I'm assuming you mean TWA. Yes. Dollars. And those dollars, are they from a segregated fund or those from your general general dollars out of your license fund? I, I'm trying to 
just understand and for the benefit of those who may be watching where those dollars are coming from within TWRA? Um, I'm fairly certain it's, it's a blend of certainly the uh, marine fuel tax money that we receive and potentially reserve, just, just like a little license dollars mixed into that. But that, that's been, that, that's what I call state dollars, as opposed right. to sport fish restoration money, which is also Fish and Wildlife Service money. But those, those are not used for uh, commercial ventures uh, ever. So that has to be on the sport fish side. So it's okay. not those dollars, which, is, which funds a large part of our agency. Okay, or thank in you. Fisheries anyway. Okay. All right, um, any other questions for, for Rob? Uh, Rob Goad, any more? No, they're not, thank you. But we appreciate you making the trip here today. All right, thank you. Uh, next, we're going to hear from uh, Clay Young. And Clay, we appreciate you making the trip over here today as well. You probably could be on the water. <laughs> well, thank you for uh, inviting me to this to speak. Uh, I'm going to give you a little brief history of uh, when we started in the incentive program. I believe it was. 2018, Frank, when, the, yeah, uh, we started and we were buying probably around 25 to 30,000 pounds a month at that time. And uh, over the years, it's grown, it's grown. We've uh, went into the uh, selling the carp into the bait business up in Maine and in Florida and Louisiana. And last Last month was our biggest month, three hundred fifty-six thousand. Can can you making. at least for the for the benefit of me, yes. uh, can you describe your business a little bit? Yes, we are a we were first a caviar company. We did catfish and some wholesale buffalo. And when the incentive program came, I met with uh, Frank and Eric Gaines, and uh, we wanted to help you know do some stuff with the Asian carp. And at first, we hauled our carp to Kentucky and um, we had about four fishermen at the start and now we've got about eight, I think eight or nine that fish for us now. Uh, where we had a problem with hauling into Kentucky, the, the carp buyers up there, they might buy for 10 months and then they would shut down for three. And you know, it was just our guys, you, once you make your boat and everything for carp fishing, you can't just keep switching back and forth you know you build the net you're you're doing that and it was getting hard and then i had met with baron huber about a year and a half ago and then we started going into the bait business we we have a room that has uh four band saws uh, you know the employees cut it up in certain sizes what the bait companies want freeze it and then we ship it out truckload at a time and if you don't mind me asking oh, again, because yes, I'm completely mm -hmm. unfamiliar with, with how you operate. When you say you have eight fishermen, these eight contract fishermen or these employees of your of they your are, They are just, uh, I guess you'd call them contract. Yes, we okay. just pay them per pound, the incentive okay. and then the poundage and everything. And uh, I fish myself part-time, trying okay. to run the business. And then my son-in-law's also there. He fishes. Where's the operation located? In Paris, Tennessee. Paris, Tennessee. Paris, yes, sir. And... Um, Um, what uh, what I would like to see, you know, we've got potential to go even further from 350 to maybe a half a million to 600,000 pounds a month, but the storage, you know, every, it seems like every time we build a freezer, we're getting another contract for bait somewhere else, you know, and it's just trying to freeze that stuff in 24 hours, store it and move it. Um, I had talked to Dennis Tumlin a little bit about that, about us needing another freezer there to help out with the bait. Um, and uh, I would like to see the net program come back if we could maybe, I mean, the incentive program is all on TWA. I'd like to see if we could maybe get another part of the state agent, you know, somewhere to help with some of that money, you know, because the, the net program was huge. I mean, um, and was that, that was the initial 75,000 that, that the state put in? No, that was, I think, uh, I got like a, 
uh, pallet jack and some totes and then the other place got an ice machine you know and stuff like that out of that this was a uh, you would have to explain and how that yeah yeah okay yeah. and uh, it just it helps out the fishermen uh, uh, Henry County as Rob had talked about had done a boat program where it was a 0% loan for a couple of fishermen, myself, one of them. Uh, if we could see if that could come back, you know, in some other agency. And uh, to talk about the incentive program again, it's just, it, it seems like every six months we are, we're growing, you know, a million pounds here, a million pounds there. And if another agency or something could help TWA out and maybe get that to, a, you know, 1 million or 1.25 million yearly or something, I think we could basically put the pedal down and go as hard as we could and remove more fish. Because right now with the, another contract we just got with a bait company in Florida, it's going to add probably another million and a half to two million pounds per year just for us, you know. But right now, I don't have the capacity to put the thumbs up for it. Right, right. And so. uh, just another question Is there anybody else out there in, in West Tennessee and uh, up along the Tennessee River, I guess a competitor? Anybody else? Out uh, there Hart's doing the Fish same Market, thing? They, they buy carp. They, their business model is a little different. They haul to Kentucky. Mm -hmm. You know, they just, they buy, ice it down, put it on trucks and haul. I just, I like to be guaranteed where I could sell my fish. You know, I don't like to shut my fishermen off for a week or two, something like that. So we went with the bait. And we have a baiter machine that was purchased through the grant program that will be here, we hope, in the next month or so. COVID has kind of slowed it down. That's a mincemeat machine that basically separates the bone from the, the meat. Well, there's a huge market in protein. You know, that's a, that's a protein product, Jewish market, all of that. Uh, we're hoping to have that going pretty soon. We built a room onto our place for that, and we've actually already got orders for that as soon as the machine comes in. And... Uh, that can lead to bigger things in the future like making fish patties we we actually talked to the governor at one time and stuff about uh getting it into the school systems and jails and and prison system and stuff like that covid kind of killed that but um you know these machines are what you need for that so any questions no. more? yes sir oh yes mike butler Clay, uh, good to see you. Uh, one question that I'm curious about is at what price point do you think this market could become self-sustainable, price per pound? In other words, we talked about human food use being really where it needs to get to. Yeah. At what point does it become a self-sustaining market, in your opinion? It would, I mean, it would probably, it would have to be the, uh, the food grade, you know. I, I mean, it is a carp. You know, that, that's, that's the problem. It's not a tuna or a salmon, something like that. Uh, getting it in the prison system and school systems and stuff, I think you could, you could see the incentive lower on the fish. But with the bait contracts, we are taking a fish from the state of Tennessee, and I'm competing with commercial fishermen that are fishing in Maine that are driving their boat up to this place and offloading it no, i've no, got cost transportation of cost. transportation freezer you know and so that's where the incentive is vital on that right there uh, mr chairman i would like uh, to ask it's appropriations season right now in in congress and and we have been working very hard to get the appropriation requests in for the continued department of interior funding which is helping some of what we've heard about today. Mm -hmm. Plus, uh, there's an additional $25 million that was authorized but not appropriated 20, for yeah. barriers and, and deterrence. And um, I just wanted to 
let the, the, the commission know that we're going to be maybe reaching out to folks, maybe try to put together a letter from the commission, if that would be amenable to you, Absolutely. to send to the delegation. Absolutely. And Clay, we maybe we, we would love to have your participation in that. Yes, sir. That's my point for bringing it up now, is we, we, we're going to need everybody on board saying this is something we need. We've gotten good reception so far. Okay. Um, and all the House members have their requests in, but we need to reinforce those, and we need to get to Senator Haggerty. Thank you, Mike. Oh, Dennis? Question, sir. Hey, Clay, good yes, to sir. see you again. Good to see you. Um, when we met, you were talking about that high-speed freezer, that flash freezer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that. Um, when I met with Clay, I went out a couple weeks ago, and I just was really asking about the bottlenecks. You know, I said, could you increase production double tomorrow? And he said, ah, I've got a couple of issues that would keep me from doubling production. So one of those was a flash freezer. Talk yes, about sir. your current freezing time. And if, if you needed to sell six truckloads to Baron, who is here, Baron Hubner, um, Tell, tell me about that freezer um, and the bottlenecks that you have, sir. Thank yes, you. Sir. Uh, what we have right now, we can hold about, I'm going to say, three and a half truckloads, maybe up to four if I were really cram it in there. But the problem is, is you've got to have that space to freeze also. You know, you're putting a, this fish comes in a boat, we put it in an ice bath, get it down to 50 degrees, somewhere around there, and then they're cutting it up, putting it in boxes. Well, you've got to have somewhere that it sits 24 to 30 hours to get rock hard and then move it. So it really cuts you down to only being able to hold maybe two truckloads if you've got 16 to 20,000 pounds coming in every day because you can't stack it pallet high. You've got to do it too high and spread it out and that's where we were talking a 40 by 60 uh, blast freezer a blast freezer what it does it it gets down to negative 15 temperature where mine if you open the door and you put 10 pallets in there it's going to get to 30 degrees if that's four o'clock in the afternoon it might be two two o'clock in the morning before it ever gets back to negative 15 a blast you open the door, you put it in, you shut it 30 minutes later, it's negative 15 again. So that would increase your freezing time, you know, eight hours, 10 hours to freeze a load like that. And then plus uh, building it where two pallets could go high, it could hold 220 pallets, which is 11 truckloads. And with our Florida stuff, Maine has not even started buying yet for this year. They start in, what is it, Baron, April, in May, yeah, 1st of May. Well, we're doing all we can to get two truckloads out a week right now. You know, there's two companies up there that's going to probably take one to two truckloads each a week. And that's where, you know, and I've, I've rented two reefers that I have on my property right now that we're using for extra freezer storage. Mr. Yep. Chairman. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I would just like to say, uh, Rob, I know uh, Rob and, and uh, Henry County Chamber of Commerce does a great job streamlining this process. Uh, I think uh, getting the money to where it needs to be and, and the accountability portion of it. Like he said, I know Clay and Baron and his son-in-law have have uh, absolutely made a dent. I've been able to go out uh, with these gentlemen actually on the lake and run the nets. Uh, I've been looking at side scans a lot on Kentucky Lake from the Kentucky line all the way to the uh, town of Big Sandy. Uh, and I've been on the Mississippi River uh, in places that he suggested to look at it as well and compare the, you know, the difference. Obviously, I've got no complete data that I need to report here today, but um, there are a lot of Asian carp in Kentucky Lake still right now. Uh, the first night I went out with them, uh, we worked two and a half hours, and I don't know how many thousands of pounds of like fish. 3,800. 3,800 3, pounds. Well, it was close to knee deep on me. Uh, you know, and, and the big thing that they've learned, I met with them one night last week and they were going out of Antioch Harbor in the Mansard Island area. And I think, how, how, many, what, how many pounds did they get out of the Mansard Island Cove? Uh, 13, 
13, 14, 000. 13, 14, yeah. thousand. And I'm talking about a cove, not much bigger in this parking lot, the paved area, this building and out front. I'm not talking about just a huge area. Uh, it, it's, it's a small cove. It, it's got one marina in it. Uh, it's a lot of Asian carp in there. Um, so I, I think, you know, coming just for me, being a, a Henry County resident, I think they and, and the other gentlemen, the Hearts Fish Market, North American Caviar, are absolutely making a dent in it. The, you know, the biggest problem I talked to his son-in-law the other night at the boat ramp, we were down there, and he said uh, uh, he got in trouble uh, the night before because they hauled out so many fish and popped two boat tires on the trailer because they had so much weight of fish in the boat. Yeah, they, <laughs> they had one night him and another fisherman hit 25,000 right, you know where uh, Buchanan Resort is? Just right out from there. They made one... We call it drive sets. What we do is we fire the net out of the boat real fast, circle the school, and then you beat the water and make noise in your boat and you'll run those fish. But they made one set and it took them 12 hours to pick them. But it was right at, it was 24,700 and something pounds. A lot, a lot of Asian carp in Kentucky Lake. Um, and you know, and, I, and I'll say this as well, uh, in years past, I don't know if commercial fishermen uh, after I've talked to several, maybe not have been the most popular people on the lake. If you've got people out there recreational boating or bass fishing and they're trying to run nets and this and that, and uh, they actually get applause at the boat ramp and they'll let them put in first in front of people trying to go out to crappie fish because they're taking care of the Asian carp. I've seen it. Um, and I'd never seen people back out and let them put in first. Uh, so I was shocked at that. So I would like to learn from, from uh, being on this commission, uh, the barriers that we need to put into place. I, 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 you know, I'm interested in seeing what, what barriers have worked in other places up north. What works up north? I know they're doing some very uh, extensive research and, and uh, at Barclay and all these other places. But you know, what barriers have worked in other places? And I know Mr. Butler is working on the funding as well as all of us. I think that's going to be critical about getting the ball rolling, getting these barriers in. But I think at this point in time, just coming from Omani's standpoint, uh, these gentlemen right here are, are putting a dent in it. But now be mindful of this. It's not like they go from one end of the lake to the other. Most of these commercial fishermen have their own spots. And like they'll have 10 spots. They'll fish spot one on Monday. Ten days later, they circle back to spot one. Well, they'll catch ten to twelve to seven thousand pounds of fish on spot one. Ten days later, they circle back to spot one, and they catch the same amount of fish out of the same spot. It's not like we're just running a cove dry. You know what I mean? Um, I think I, what it's helped. A lot, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. No, go ahead. Uh, us going in the bays at night and catching these fish and keeping them out. You know. Your sport fishermen are getting more time. They can go in there during the day. The fish hadn't moved back in. They get to fish. They catch bass, crappie, brim, you know, and then, you know, they see here we come at like 6 or 7 o'clock at night rolling in there, and then we're, we're doing most of the fishing at night. There's some guys that still set net and stuff, but we most of my guys are driving fish now, and we do it at night. Yeah. yeah. And it's, I, I would like to, uh, I don't know if we can do this, but if any of us could ever have a meeting in Henry County somewhere and actually go out with them one night and actually see how the process works and go back to either Hart's Fish Market or uh, yeah, his, have, his office. And, I've got and, net picks, everybody closed. You can. Well, the only advice I can give everybody <laughs> is I like to talk, but you can't talk in the boat because as soon as you open your mouth, you know what's going to go in it? some slime from Asian because you're standing about knee deep in them in the boat. I'm just telling you, you, you keep your mouth shut and throw the fish in the boat. <laughs> or if you don't, you get a mouthful. But uh, it's, it's hard work. It's extremely hard work. You're getting caught on, you know, debris in the bottom. You're pulling the nets. The, it's, you know, you're dealing with nets every which direction, the wind, the, getting caught in the boat motor. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a task to do it. And then you're dealing with thousands of pounds of fish at the end of the day you just getting them in the boats part of the work you know so you know i commend them and i would like to personally support them any way we can financially uh and through uh rob's uh through the chamber uh to making a dent in kentucky lake okay right, thank you yeah all right same
Hey, yeah, real cl uh, quick, Clay. Um, I work at, um, in economic development in Tennessee. We've got some significant um, pet food manufacturers that we've mm -hmm. worked with. Mm -hmm. Just wondering if, if, like, that's a potential market for carp or if any of those conversations have taken place. We talked to a few of the pet food, the price. It's the price. It's almost like a bone mill price. It's like they want to pay two or three cents a pound, you know, for the fish. It just... It, it just, you know, uh, you couldn't make it to where a fisherman could make, you know, 15 cents a pound or anything. Okay. But, yeah. Um, so for the, the, the ones that I've talked to, you know. So. so maybe for that to work, there might have to be some, like, an additional incentive from the state side to mm -hmm. supplement what, they're, what the private sector Yeah, it, it gets pretty low. It's like the bone mill plants. They pay eight cents. Okay. So, you know, you're... You're doing the 15, you get the seven back, the six back, you've got, you know, two, but then you've got to take your diesel, your employee, your ice, your electricity. So you start making a couple cents a pound on that fish. One truck breaks down, your profit for six months is gone. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's kind of why we looked at the bait and, and other options, you know, to yeah. try to get the price up. Okay. So, Good stuff. Yes, sir. Thanks. Dennis? Yes, sir. One last question. Clay, you prompted me when you talked about that corralling method. When we met, you talked about one regulation you thought could help you, the length of the net set. Yes. Can you comment yes. on that? What uh, you I have, uh, well, we'll have our uh, CFAC meeting this year uh, talking about making our main net uh, just for driving the fish 600 yards where we could put out because Sometimes you find a school and you're taking that 300 yard and you're literally running out before you close those fish off and you're trying to, you know, you're trying to throw this anchor out, throw another one and you're going 15 miles an hour in a boat trying to make those nets close because it has to be two. If it was a 600, I think it would, that would be plenty of length. Just for those in the room, I believe the current regulation is 300 yards. 300 yards, yes, sir. So the current regulation only lets him run a 300-yard net, and Frank's aware of it, and they're aware, but he's liking to need that increase for that method of fishing, something he brought up to me. And, and Frank or Chris, is that a rule? So would, that be a, would that be a rule that would have to be adopted? That, that would be in our proclamation. Proclamation. Okay. And, and Clay, I want to ask you the same question uh, that I asked uh, the last presenter is if you had the magic wand, what would the, what would the, um, what could the state or TWRA put money into right now that would help you increase com capacity and not just you, uh, uh, somebody who yeah. served on an oversight committee now going on 15 years, one of the things that the state has to be very, uh, cautious about be it TWRA or any other state agency is doing something that benefits one one person what could we do to increase competition what could we do to help your industry that you're involved in if we could do it right now what would it be it, uh, equipment like I talked about a freezer a the freezer other, the other ones can't you know I don't know but I know you know anything that could help them you know might be trucks trailers to haul with ice machines, uh, maybe some kind of uh, incentive, uh, like a grant or something on transportation. You know, we're, right now, you know how the trucking industry with COVID and stuff, it's like every week you call, it's going up, you know, $500, $400. Well, when you're working on that three to four cent, you know, profit margin, it just keeps getting smaller. You know, something like that, if, you know, if you send, 30 trucks to Maine or something, maybe some kind of incentive or, or you know, 40% of the truck cost or something and, uh, you know, net program, I've, I've said that. And I think I think that could help everything. Uh, freezer for me, it could, it can make me right now move another 150, 200,000 pounds a month. And you have the, your, your fishermen that you contract with would have the capacity to to yes, get that many yes. fish. I actually have started co-oping with the other Asian carp buyer. I am buying fish from him because we're moving so many. And it helps him because that day that I buy, he doesn't have to haul to Kentucky.
Okay. And and I know Dennis, uh, one of the notes he wrote me a, little, uh, a few minutes ago, and, and I can't remember if you said it uh, in your presentation, but we're this type freezer is roughly 400000 half million dollars. Somewhere in there, yeah, four hundred, three to 400 somewhere in there. Okay. All right, thank you. All Any right. further questions? Yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Any further questions for Clay? Seeing on Clay, thank you. Thanks right. for being thank with us today. And and I know he's been mentioned a couple of times, but Baron Hubner, thank you for being with us today. Any short um, message you want to give us since you're here? Now, as I understand, are you a buyer? Is that correct? Or yes, sir. I Where, where's home for you? My, my home is in Birmingham, Alabama. Okay. You recognize? Just one thing, Chairman. Didn't, Baron, didn't you play college football? No, I did not. We, <laughs> uh, we can't yeah. I think, Mr. Chairman, I think you played for Alabama. No further comment? I repent. I repent. <laughs> Goodness, and he got in here. Sorry about that, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, well, I appreciate that. I uh, appreciate you being here today. Um, 
let's see, next, uh, old business, status of economic study. Dennis? I think we talked about it last time, and, and uh, I know TWRA Commission may want to talk about it. Um, Chris or Frank, I, I think you brought it up at one of your commission meetings after our last. Do you have a resolution or where that's at by chance? Sorry to put you on the spot. Uh, the, the, he was asking about the, the economic study. We did not have that in front of the, the Fish and Wildlife Commission. We just talked about that internally. We did, uh, we did talk, I think we got another proposal that was uh, higher, about roughly a quarter million dollars for that. Yep. And uh, Dr. Fox, who we were interested in working with on that, was not interested in working on that particular project. So we have some decisions to make, I guess, at that okay. point. It's a, it's a different, we're asking about a different product or a different price point and uh, principal investigator. Yeah, so UT gave us a, you know, it went from 149 to 250 roughly. Um, sounds like there's some internal discussion on where that needs to be. But I'm not, the whole purpose of doing that was to, for us to allocate more money. We was trying to understand the loss. And if we don't feel like we even need that study, if we know there's a huge opportunity and there's a huge loss coming, we don't have to even move on that study. So we'll, we'll keep that one on the, um, on the radar. Okay. Yeah, and if I remember part of the discussion um, that we had around this, though the benefit of the study I think was was uh, maybe maybe more directed at possibility of federal funds and being able to quantify the problem and quantify how much economic damage uh, potentially is coming from this problem in order to help draw down federal funds. Mike, is that is my memory correct on that? I believe that's correct, Mr. Chairman. I think um, one of the things though that we've been able to see and Dennis actually has been helpful with this is the loss of, of revenue for say fishing tournaments, things like that. Yeah. That we can quantify. I think we have definitely, uh, uh, with Senator Alexander's help, uh, made well known the status and the scope of the problem. So I think we're in a pretty good spot if we can get a big push here in the next couple of months to get these appropriations across the wire. We, we've gotten the second year of the 25 million, which included that 14 additional million dollars. So that's starting to become a recurring issue, uh, which is where we want to be on that and then if we can get this deterrent barrier money in the door then we'll be off the races we can we can punch it up there to around 45 50 million dollars i'd like to clarify that those funds that we have that 14 million dollars for example that's base and wide that's not the state of Tennessee right. correct for right. those viewing at home yeah one other thing that i'm going to try to make myself a note to do and, I, and while it, at um one side i'm I don't want to put too much pressure on them. The other, the other part of me wants some pressure to be brought to bear on them. We had a, we had a real champion on this issue uh, with Senator Alexander. Not to say that uh, Senator Haggerty's not going to be the same type of champion on it, but we need to invite his and, and Senator Blackburn's representatives to these meetings next time so they can hear uh, this discussion and be able to report back to the senators. I'm having breakfast with one of them tomorrow. And I can tell you, Senator Haggerty has already uh, indicated strong interest in being and picking up the mantle from where Senator Alexander left off and being a champion on this. Good, good. All right, thank you. Any other old business? Um, seeing none, new business. I know Dennis and I had um, conversations about uh, establishing a committee or a couple committees to address marketing and business development. Dennis, you want to? Yes, thank talk you, Mr. Chairman. That? I just thought, um, you know, these meetings, if we're going to meet quarterly or however often these, uh, I feel like there's some work that can be done by some working groups. And we'd just love to see this commission look at establishing uh, a business development working group and maybe even a, a group focusing on uh, whether it's barriers or, or, or some other type of work. I think there's a lot of work that can be done day to day uh, and bring uh, those findings back, just like going out and meeting with Clay and Barron and Rob periodically, but thought it would be great to establish some working groups there. Well, if we want to have uh, one one group meet on um, uh, or committee on business development, Dennis, I would I would ask you and and uh, Sammy Arnold with ECD uh, and and Chris Richardson to to be on that uh, marketing business and marketing group uh, or committee, um, and we'll um, discuss need for any more. But that way, you three can talk about that. And and again, you've been doing a lot of this yourself, and I appreciate that. Uh, but you can have a couple other people to communicate with uh, between our meetings on those on that issue. 
Uh, any anything else? I, I would. I do want to uh, take your suggestion. I would like to schedule our next meeting um, the first of June or the first of July in Henry County, uh, and and be able to go out there have a meeting. Uh, I'm assuming there's there's going to be some type of uh, conference room that we can use in Henry County, or or if not a conference. Well, we need some place that we can have access to, even if it's just. Um, Facebook Live, some way in order to get that meeting out to the public, if at all possible, but have the next meeting somewhere in Henry County. If, if you'd like to, to Chairman, try to... I, if yeah, you don't mind, I'll, kinda, yes. I'll help coordinate that with Mr. Goad and, and, and uh, some of these gentlemen about we can get together and, and, and accommodate uh, all the needs of us in making it Facebook Live or okay. stream, live streaming in it uh, as well. All right. Clay, what would be a, what would be a better month to, to come out there and to actually watch you fish Ju June July what, what would be a better month it doesn't really matter okay um, what about first week of July July 4th what uh, let me pull the calendar out here anybody else got a specific date they want to throw out um, let's see second week of June is my wedding anniversary that week won't work let's see um, I'm sorry Last, the last full week of June would be the week of the 21st. Um, how would June 24th, which would be a Thursday, how would that sound for everybody? All right, let's, let's, let's schedule this for June 24th. Um, uh, date or time and place will follow. Yes, yes, Commissioner. Agreed, and it's done. Um, and and one of one of the things I'd like for you to look at, and maybe report back to the committee next time we meet. And I meant to ask this question when we had a, had our guests up there. Um, you know, she, Dr. Um, Dr. Lewis said they were hoping maybe in a year or so to have um, a study complete. Know where they're going to be. What could we do now? Uh, and, and they also said it it may take a year or longer uh, to get the approval for a barrier at you know, Nickajack. What could we do now that when they have their study complete, if we had ten million dollars through some source of federal and state funding, we would be ready to go then. We'd be ready to go. Now I know some of the things can't be done, the archaeological study or uh, the, uh, environmental impact studies might could be done. What could we start working on now? Mike? Mr. Chairman, um, Mr. Deese may have an update on the timeline on the the NEPA study that is required part of what uh, Dr. Lewis was talking about would right. have included that and I think we're getting close to yes uh, yes Mr. Chairman we're um, TVA is uh, funding and commenced on the uh, programmatic environmental assessment so we're in the process of that um, within the next few months uh, June will be a, a public comment period uh, looking to have um, that process the EA complete uh, late summer, early fall. So we're already in progress with that, making good progress. I think the the next question would be, if it a lot, if we have uh, the study tells us that it's okay to put barriers at ten of the locks uh, throughout the Tennessee River system, uh, the next question would be permitting. What types of permits would be required? Right. So I think um, maybe the committee could look at the permitting aspect uh, to be ready once this EA is complete. Okay, and let me ask a question again for my information. Everybody else sitting up here may know the answer to this, but this NEPA study, uh, is it specific to one location or is it system-wide? Uh, 
It's specific to 10 locks that we're looking at. To what? I mean, ten, 10 locks. Okay. Rebel locks. All right. Thank you. Anything else? Well, any further business that needs to come before the committee? Seeing Ch none. Chairman, can I oh, ask one question? Yes. Um, when will we, I guess it'll be in June, or when will we make like any budgetary recommendations and how do we do that if we're going to if we're going to try to fund a chip um i say that right a chip some more um how would we do that when do we make that recommendation and then then i guess that goes to the twr commissioner how does that work i've actually been texting the governor's office uh part of the time that we've been sitting up here and i'm going to get be getting with uh um the assistant executive director chris richardson and having some conversations with him uh, about uh, about just what you ask, and then uh, having those conversations with the governor's office as well. Any further business need to come before the commission? Seeing none, thank you for being here today. Uh, and Bobby Wilson, director, thank you for being here with us. All right.